Sorry, I had a quick question. Yep. So the midterm, right? Is it? It's going to be online. I'm assuming. Yeah, correct. And we're going to need the respondents and all the whole thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So just uh, before we get started with the lecture, hi everybody. Um, just on note with uh, what Ahmed was saying about the midterm, and Michaela was asking it as well. Um, the midterm is going to be in three weeks' time, so that is March 11th, and it'll be on um, through Canvas uh, with Respondus Monitor or Browser Lockdown, um, and then it would uh, just be completed in class time. So it'll be at this time in three weeks, so that's March 11th. I'll be posting a breakdown of what the uh, midterm entails and then how much of content is from each lecture. So that'll help you or assist you with uh, studying for the midterm. There's a sample midterm I think already posted. So then it'll give you a better idea of questions as well. Don't forget to continue to do the um, those quizzes that you can log back in and back out. That'll give you a good um, sort of basis as to whether or not you can answer those questions and therefore if you are understanding the material or the main um, important parts of um, the lectures. And then also don't forget about choosing your uh, assignment topic just so that way you can lock it in and um, keep it in mind as you're going through the lectures and then be able to complete um, the task that you, or more skill that you want to do in the end. So before we get started, is there any questions? Labs are going okay? Okay, awesome. So this is the fifth lecture uh, for the course. And uh, last day we got into motor control theories or looking at how research have investigated the different uh, um, variables that impact our ability to perform different types of motor skills. And so today what we're going to do is evaluate um, those variables in types of different motor skills and talk about what research has sort of determined or found um, through those analyses. And then we'll finish off with how research has sort of considered what is going on in the um, action preparation phase. So the phase we talked about was reaction time or the interval between choosing to move and then the initiation of movement. Sort of how can we analyze the processing that's occurring um, in the brain uh, during that time. There you go. Can we all see this? Everyone's good? Everyone can see the, uh, the slides? Perfect. Okay, awesome. Okay, so the breakdown of the lecture is going to go uh, through understanding how um, we've researched different variables for each of these types of motor skills. And then we're going to go into action preparation and how research has looked at how you can sort of better understand the processing required um, in performing motor skills, and then what we've learned um, through research about what would impact more or less processing. Now, just like last lecture, and I, I feel like you may have already sort of felt this way, that it's a lot of information. And so I just wanted to reiterate that um, I put all of the information that would be testable or for like better comprehension on the slides. And what I want to do in the lectures is to go through the main points or the meat of the material. And so that way it gives you a nice backbone or outline of the most important parts. You can digest it and then when you go back into the lecture and sort of read around it, it gives you more information around those backbone pieces and you can better understand it. Is that okay? Is there any feedback as to how you guys are feeling about the course of the material before I get started? We, we good. No, no, Ahmed, we gonna be great. Awesome, okay. So I, like, I, I always enjoy uh, the way that this uh, lecture format has on where it ends up becoming a lot of like basically a conversation about the material in the lecture. Um, 
And so if there's anything um, that you guys like the best or don't like, then always you know, feel free to tell me. I just want to make sure that everyone's learning. Um, given the times, it's already stressful enough. And so um, what I can do to teach the course but also make it easier for everyone, um, and myself obviously, then um, I'm willing to do that. So let's first talk about how uh, research in motor control sort of started. Remember we looked at that video in the very, very first lecture about um, trying to classify different motor skills, try to understand if there's you know, similarities between types of um, gross motor skills versus continuous motor skills, and maybe the processing required in each of those is similar, or it can give us basis or an idea of how our body is um, specifically able to control motion so consistently and accurately in uh, changing environmental conditions. And so the first sort of uh, skill that was easiest to analyze was simple reaching and pointing tasks. Now, what was one uh, sort of principle that um, we were all familiar with when it came up, but researchers um, initially already had sort of observed when doing um, analysis of motor skills? This was the speed accuracy trade-off, and in that when um, we tend to do things faster, it leads to more errors. And if we want to do things more accurately, we technically tend to move slower. Do we all remember that or can we all sort of agree on that point? It's, it's fairly observable, right? And we can all consistently also agree on that just coming out of, out of just daily life observations within ourselves. So that was something that was easy to test and to see if maybe we could come up with some sort of variables around that. Paul Fitz was the first researcher to try and analyze this. Now this was um, way before even a lot of the motor control theories uh, developed. This was in 1954. But based on that observation, um, the Fitz lab wanted to sort of develop an equation or see if they could develop an equation um, that would allow for sort of the guessing of how different um, accuracy constraints would affect our movement speed. And so what they did was they developed this quick little um, sort of laboratory setting where they had a participant sitting at a table much like I am right now. And then you can see that they had a metal board with two targets on the table. And then they had a metal stylus that would be used to touch the targets and then be able to indicate when there was a successful touch. And so the goal of these experiments was to see how fast someone would tap the targets and then change the target sizes and distances between the targets and see if movement speed changed. And so by changing the target widths and the distance between the targets, so actually if I can go back and just show you guys right there. So this is what was on the table. They had different distances between the two targets and then they changed the different or the widths of the different targets. So by having a smaller target it would technically be harder. So that would be an increasing accuracy constraint. And what they were able to do was they utilize a whole bunch of participants and used a whole bunch of different distances and target widths. And they were able to develop this exponential equation where you could um, guess or estimate the movement time of the participant, so how long it would take to complete the task, based on a ratio of the distance between the targets over the width of the targets. Now this equation was specifically used to estimate the time of movement in only that study, so it wasn't really applicable to other sort of tasks because that number of, okay, well, it'll take you 30 seconds to go from one target to another. That part wasn't really applicable to other studies. However, this 
part of the equation called the index of difficulty. It was basically the quantifiable or exponential measurement of difficulty and how the, it was a ratio that they could utilize to understand how the difficulty would increase exponentially because it wasn't linear. It would, and we can see that, right? So if, if well, I'm trying to think of different examples. If you can think of one, let me know. But as we increase the accuracy constraints, there's an exponential effect on our movement speed. So from this study, they developed this exponential way to indicate difficulty. So they gave a quantifiable number for difficulty and they called it the index of difficulty. And then the letters in the equation, so the, the logarithmic part or the exponential part is right here. And then the D is the distance between the targets. And then W was the width of the targets. And so that gave, so think of like a graph, right? It gave um, sort of a visual of how difficulty would increase based on accuracy constraints. So this was the first time that this was developed and they were able to use that equation, the index of difficulty part, to see if, it's, if it held true with different um, types of motor skills, where they would obviously have to define different ways to describe the accuracy and distance, but they wanted to see if that exponential sort of um, visual stayed true. Here's a visual of sort of, um, to better describe sort of uh, the change in of difficulty utilizing this target phenomenon. So I don't know if you can see, you might have to get up real close, but here we have two different target sizes. So imagine the fifth study where you would have to have a stylus and you're pointing in between the two targets. Based on the index of difficulty equation, this, where we have one centimeter with targets that are four centimeters apart, this would be an index of difficulty of three. Now here, we have targets that are further apart, but they're wider. So here we have targets that are two centimeters apart, and they're eight, sorry, two centimeters in width, but they're eight centimeters apart. If you plug it into the equation, this would also give us an index of difficulty of three. So based on the equation that was utilized in that very early research, you could say that the difficulty of each of these tasks, so a very simple reaching and pointing task, would be um, the same. So Samantha's asking a question, would they hit the spot within the targets? Play into the equation? Uh, no, you could, you could, but they just, they, uh, it was just touching the target. So I guess as they, I don't know what values they use, but as they shorten and, and decrease the size of the target, we would see a larger and larger effect. Because I guess for them, it was more important to describe the width as the accuracy constraint. So as a wider one, doesn't matter where you hit it. It was more based on describing, you know, this, this idea of difficulty. But look at the second example here, where now we have the targets of different sizes, both two centimeters apart, but one has a width of two centimeters. And then the second option has a width of target of one centimeter. So this would be an index of difficulty of one, and this would be an index of difficulty of two, even though they're the same distance apart. So this equation allows us to at least give a visual of difficulty. Just like Gentile's taxonomy, do you guys remember that from the very, very first lecture? It gave us a way to visualize how to stepwise, or in a stepwise fashion, increase the difficulty of different motor skills for a patient in a rehabilitation setting. And so once this was developed, 
research likes numbers, and so it was very popular. And so what happened moving forward was that um, researchers wanted to look at whether or not this uh, sort of um, value from this equation from the Fitts law was comparable to other types of motor skills. And what was found is that it generally holds true, that there's this exponential increase um, in difficulty based on accuracy constraints, which is something we can all agree on that we've already observed in our real life. But now we have a math sort of equation to it. Then you can alter different variables and see what has a greater effect on this um, measurement. And then we can get a better understanding of different processes um, or to prioritize what our body uses in the processing of um, motor control. So the, the this um, equation was held true in dart throwing. Um, they did it on uh, looking at uh, moving a cursor on a computer screen. Um, here they tried to use it in a rehabilitation setting. So I don't know if any of you work in a, sort of a hospital or with stroke patients, but this is a pegboard um, manipulation uh, task. And so you can have the patient practice reaching and grasping and moving different objects. Yeah, that's, that's what it's for, right? The equation also held true with reaching and grasping for different containers. Yeah, so there's pegs and cones, yeah. See here, it's so, I don't know if you, you guys can zoom in, but this would be practice on different, like manipulating different objects. So not just pegs, this would be a good start. And now we are going to practice in this study, grasping different objects you would see in daily life. Can you ask a question? That's why we get it. Yes. And so I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring that um, sort of example back, Casey, because the question was then, um, is reaching and grasping. So if, if I have to, so with all of those, it was reaching and pointing, right? So Fitz law, you're basically just reaching and pointing and it held and it showed this speed accuracy trade-off. What happens if you have to grab a, uh, an object and manipulate it? Is that, uh, let me ask you guys a question is, the reaching and pointing one motor skill and then grabbing another motor skill? Or is the whole, or is it a different motor skill for reaching and grabbing of different objects? Yeah, so actually Jeffrey and Matthew, it is each of those are a different motor skill. The motor skill part is, is the object. And we'll get into that in the next slides. But applications of this concept of Fitz law or the speed accuracy trade-off um, is applied to sort of technology in a sense where, I mean, this is pretty old now, but when applying it to like our apps or our phones, um, you can see sort of this concept that if objects that are further apart or smaller in terms of target size are harder, then frequent tasks when we're developing apps or software Frequent tasks should be um, positioned closer to the starting position. And so you can see this here and even in our consoles. And that the um, tasks that are done more frequently should have larger buttons. Because if we plug that into the Fitz law equation or just even common sense, it means that it would be less difficult to touch or you know, interact with those buttons. So we, so it was, it was good. It was a good start in terms of research to sort of be able to apply math to um, an observation, and motor control studies sort of um, led on from that. And remember what we talked about last day in that um, with our motor control theories, they had to account for the fact that the body had to work in either an open or closed loop system. And what was the difference between the two? Yes, closed loop is feedback. And so basically whether or not we can work in an open or closed loop system is gonna be based on how fast we have to do the, the movement. And so 
as what the sort of when applying this concept to the speed accuracy skills with harder um, difficulty or increasing uh, difficulty uh, or sorry decreasing the target size what we had to do was we had to move slower to maintain accuracy and to work in a closed loop system so if the targets were really big we could work in an open loop system where the brain just has to process okay it looks at the target that's how far it is um, this is what's required and then it can work in an open loop system where the information getting sent out to the muscle contains all of the information necessary for completion of the motor skill. But if we, as we increase accuracy constraints, we have to rely on feedback to make sure we are accurately hitting the target. And so we have to work in a closed loop system. And when working in a closed loop system, we have to slow down speed. Does that make sense? So it's sort of like understanding the motor control behind the speed accuracy trade-off. Does it make sense, everyone? Cool. And so Last day, we talked about at the end that in terms of the different sensory processes that we utilize, so we talked about what? Touch, proprioception, and vision. We talked about how vision was the most important. Um, our body tends to prioritize vision over all of the different senses. We talked about central versus vision, uh, yeah. central vision versus peripheral vision. And so let's look at what research considered when evaluating different skills. So we're talking about, again, manual aiming skills here. And so what research wanted to look at was how is vision utilized in these skills? Well, in the preparation phase, so even before movement, we're going to look at the target, and then that's going to, right, think about a motor program, target size, distance, maybe objects in the area. That's going to be a parameter added to the motor program and then processed, okay, this is how we're gonna move based on these parameters or this environment. So in the preparation phase, vision is gonna be very important to, get, to obtain that information from the target. So would that be central vision or peripheral vision? No, per oh, oh, remember Ahmed? Ahmed was just like his girlfriend's freaking out in the car. Yeah, so central vision. Central vision is the very uh, specific um, central view of vision that's for picking up all of this very important stuff that's added to the motor program. Peripheral vision is for monitoring um, movement. And so you look at the target, that's inputted into the motor program. Then we start to move. And as we're moving, we're probably going to look at the target, right? As we start moving, we can look away, but we're going to center again on the target to see if we're getting close to it. Our peripheral vision is gonna monitor movement of the limb or if there's any movement in the periphery. But how do we time our movements? we time it with this time to contact concept and that has to happen through central vision. And so what we see in this motor skill and in all other motor skills that require timing, that it's focusing on the object of the last moment that's going to give us the estimation of time to contact. So in a simple reaching and pointing skill, we're going to look at the target that's gonna give us the information we need to move and then as we continue, as we're moving, we're going to look at the target to give us an idea of time to contact. That's central vision. And then in the termination phase, we're also utilizing peripheral vision for movement of the periphery. And then as 
our tar as our stylus or pointing whatever comes into view of the object, we can visualize that yes, we've hit it. And so that's just a simple example of the basic motor control process is utilized in reaching and pointing. But as Casey had said, in, in a rehab setting, they have a whole bunch of objects to, to teach or have people relearn reaching and grasping tasks. That's called prehension. So prehension is a sort of scientific term or terminology to describe a, a motor skill that's involving reaching and grasping. So you're not just pointing, you're going to reach with the intent of manipulating the object. And so think about me reaching for this cup to drink my coffee. That, that's a prehension task. I'm reaching and grabbing to manipulate. It has the three uh, same sort of um, time points as um, was discussed in the last couple slides. Transport, except this time we're grasping, not just touching the target, and then we have the manipulation of the object. But what was found very quickly, and, and I touched on this with Casey, is that the intended use of the object or the object that we're going to be reaching and manipulating affects the way that we move our arm. And so with, um, I forget who it was, but I think it was, oh, Jeff and Matt, when you were saying that like, so re the reaching part is one motor skill, the grabbing is another motor skill. No, it's that the object and the m moving to manipulate it, that's one motor skill because all of you are probably sitting at a desk somewhere. Look at the objects that you have around you. So look up, look at an object and go to grab for it. If you are going to go grab for a cup, you tend to just, you're, you're already holding like this. If you're reaching for a wrench or a hammer, you're gonna reach with a grip that, you know, is going to be in, um, in efficiency with how you want to utilize that object. Imagine grabbing for scissors. You're already sort of grabbing with the intended use of the object in mind. Yes, exactly. And so there's different types of grips that are common. So Casey's saying, yeah, um, I guess they use uh, different specific types of grips in um, her rehab setting, the rehab setting. And, uh, and that's because there's a common type of um, similarity in different grip types. But can we all agree that depending on what object you're reaching for, you look at the object and you go to reach for it, your intended use of the object or the object itself affects the way we manipulate our, or move our hand. Therefore, each of those, if we're thinking about the invariant features of the motor control theory, each of those would be a different motor skill. So when we're rehabbing people, we need to sort of um, keep that in mind and make sure that we understand that grabbing and reaching and grabbing for different types of objects, each of those is a different motor skill. Does everyone get that? Cool, right? Because you haven't really probably considered it as of yet, but now the goal of this lecture is that I want you to be able to understand that concept and then you can apply it to wherever you end up career-wise. Other things that were found um, in those studies was that uh, this, the larger the object, the quicker you reach maximum grip size. So for a small object, you keep your hands smaller until closer to the contact. Whereas with a, like, so I have an extra large cup, right? So when I go to reach for it, my hands already increased uh, in sort of aperture or maximum grip size. You start to grip onto the object at about two thirds of movement time. And it, 
in case he's asked a question. Do a graduation with size. Yeah. Do you have any videos of those? You can show the class? I don't know, that's patient confidentiality. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So an another interesting thing is that, uh, okay, so we talked about, so if I'm gonna reach for, so the cup's here, I'm gonna reach for it. And so there's a timing of how I open my hand and when it closes to go onto the cup. If I move the object mid motor skill, I have to I redo the whole thing. So it's not like I stop, transfer, and then grip again like a robot. It's oh, like I come back and I re I it's the same motor skill. Does that does that make sense, everyone? Yeah, that's true. Try it. So, so do you understand what that means, Matthew? So if I go to grab and I move it, my arm doesn't go and then grip again. It would go, oh. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that just that observation proves that reaching that's a, that, like the reach and grasp part it's one motor skill or else why, or else why would the body do it that way and so vision when applied to sort of understanding how vision is applied to prehension tasks it, it would work in this similar fashion Uh, Ahmed's asking, is talking considered motor skill too? Uh, yeah, because uh, it's, remember how there was a sort of um, spectrum between cognitive and motor skills? So talking would be more on the cognitive side because we're thinking about what to say, but the action of talking is manipulating our mouth to have the air come out in a specific way. Remember Broca's area? That was a motor planning area for talking, for communication. Yeah. So it, when when we look at vision in um, sort of relation to prehension task, vision is also going to give us the target, but it's going to give us the object, the object size, distance, but it's also going to, that information is going to be downloaded into our brain as to what grip is required for that during the transport we're still going to have peripheral vision monitoring uh, movement our central vision is still going to have to focus on the target for time to contact and the difference is with grasping an object now we can utilize um like vision can tell us that we're grabbing it but now we're going to have touch touch is going to give us feedback as to whether or not we're gripping with uh, we're gripping it or with the right amount of effort so if i grip something and then I go to lift it up and it starts to slide, that feedback is gonna tell me, oh, I have to grip harder. Everyone okay? Cool. Oh, my, what's up, buddy? So, now let's talk about handwriting. Now, handwriting we talked about last day in that when you look at someone's handwriting, it's a good way to sort of distinguish between people. We all have our own similar writing style. So that's a sort of a uh, proof of this idea of a motor program or it shows what's called motor equivalence. That in that study we talked about last day, no matter if we wrote with our left hand or right hand or teeth or our feet, it still had the same sort of structure. I meant saying, so we start with open loop and move to closed loop and get feedback. Uh, yeah, just in general. Yeah, that's that's a concept in, in general. So for pre, yeah. So based on how fast we have to move, then we can stay in open loop or 
right? Reaching and grasping because we're manipulating an object is going to probably end up being a close, like it's going to be a close loop because then we got to manipulate it, get the feedback of how it's moving. Yeah, I think he meant whether or not you would stay in open loop, but that's that's how it works. We start off in open loop, and then it would as soon as we get feedback, that becomes closed loop. So, so uh, Casey or who else is there? Ahmed, does anyone have a paper in front of them? What I want you to do is on a piece of paper, right? I like to sit and read books on the top, then close your eyes and write it five more times. Because now let's evaluate what vision does in performing, you know, the motor skill of handwriting. Who's done it? So typically, when you close your eyes and you start writing out um, this line or whatever, you can see that your um, your writing, like your writing, it, it it doesn't follow the same line, and sometimes there's uh, omitted letters or there's errors in how you typed or um, extra letters. So vision, therefore, we can infer is used for making sure um, we're spatially in the right sort of line when we're writing. And vision is going to be necessary for just giving us feedback as to um, whether or not uh, we made any errors. Try writing something slow versus writing something fast. You're like, oh yeah, crap. Like, think about when you're texting, right? When you're excited and going fast, you screw up the letters sometimes. We should have, we should actually we should have done this with texting. So okay, so hey, hey, so Casey, do it, do it on this. So right, I like to sit and read books, write something, then close your eyes, press enter, or and then type, like type it again and see if you can like make any mistakes. Did anyone else do it other than Casey? Did anyone see those results? Yeah, so why is it there? No, no, it's quite sample. Okay. Okay. So vision, therefore, would be useful in the feedback of making sure accuracy, for example, right? So if you write something fast, you don't have to look, but it potentially could be messy or you could make mistakes. Now let's talk about bimanual coordination skills. So does anyone remember from neuroscience uh, what a bimanual coordination skill is? It's a scientific way to say a motor skill that involves the use of two hands at once. You can have symmetric bimanual coordination, something like rowing or pushing a wheelchair, something that involves use of both hands, but they're both doing the same thing. Push up. I feel like I was dancing. Um, Asymmetric bimanual coordination is a skill that involves two hands, but doing different things. So like playing guitar, playing a piano, um, what's the thing? Uh, violin, serving tennis, hockey, peeling an orange. So typically, the body prefers to work in 
symmetrical bimanual coordination. It's a lot easier, right? Can we all agree that probably for the brain, the processing required for a bimanual, sorry, for a symmetric bimanual coordination is easier than for a motor skill that involves the hands doing different things? Take that piece of paper for those of you that had it. Um, so Jennifer, um, Sam, JC, flip it over. And what I want you to do is I want you to, with your left hand, draw a circle. Okay. And then with your right hand, stop. With your right hand, draw a triangle. Okay. Now do them both at the same time. What do you see? Drawing a circle, we tended to move faster because it was easier. Drawing the triangle, we tended to slow down our speed in comparison. And then when, when we did it at the same time, our left hand slowed down to accommodate the more difficult task or triangle drawing in this case. And then how many of you did the circles look like a triangle? Perfect. So clearly it's more difficult. The, the brain's getting confused. It's trying to do two things at once. It's a, it's a motor skill, but it's involving the hands doing two different things. So what we now know is that the supplementary motor area is trying to coordinate between the two hands. So it's like it's having to do two different motor skills for one motor skill. And so through repetition, you can get better and better at it. And with Ahmed, with Ahmed is saying, it's hard because you, you have, you're trying to focus on one or the other. As you get better and better at a motor skill, you can rely more on proprioception. And so maybe with repetition, you don't have to look at, like, you can look at the more difficult one and get feedback that way and then rely on the proprioception of the other one. But you can, you can learn those skills, obviously, right? The next skill that we're going to talk about is catching a moving object. So throwing a ball and some, you're going to catch it. So catching, uh, are we okay with, uh, with the, uh, the information thus far? It was easier for a dominant hand than a triangle. Yes, that is true, right? Because our dominant hand is going to be, I'm left-handed, our dominant hand is going to be um, used to the finer control. What's and also, also this is another thing we're going to learn from motor learning aspect of the course is that there's a lot of similarity in different motor skills, right? And so, when you're presented with a novel situation, you're going to look at the situation, and your brain is going to try to pick out the. The, the, the most closing motor skill that you've already learned to try to complete it and then modify that one. So how many people have like, uh, think about it this way, think about a baseball player that goes to play tennis. They're gonna try to swing the racket like a, like a baseball bat and then realize the thing, the ball, the tennis ball flies out of the park and it's, oh, it doesn't really work and then they'll modify it. So the next skill, catching a moving object, is, is much like a pre-engine task that we were talking about, like reaching and grasping or manipulating an object. Except catching a moving object is, is maybe in a sense more difficult because you're timing your movements with an object coming towards you. And so the phases of catching a moving object are going to be looking at the object. That's going to give us our time to contact, sort of the visualization of where is that ball going to go how long I'm going to have to catch it, and an estimation of how long it's going to take. Then we look at the object and grab it. So in that sense, do we need to see the object the whole time? 
Does anyone play baseball? Or does anyone watch baseball? Has anyone ever seen baseball before? If an outfielder is sitting there waiting, right, and then they see the, the batter hits the baseball, do they look at the baseball the whole time, or do they look at where it's going to go, run, then look up and catch it? Okay, so the object that we're going, and this, is, this was true in, in the manual aiming tasks plus prehension tasks, you need to look at the object initially. That's going to give us sort of our constraints or parameters. So in baseball, looking at the object is going to give us an idea of where it's going to go. Then you can not look at it, run to the spot, or move your arm, or do whatever. And then you need to look at it again at the end. Because remember, the timing of our movements is always based on this idea of tau, or time to contact. So you need to look at it at the end, or the object, or in baseball, they need to look at the ball again so that they can get feedback and make sure that they're going to close or grasp on the object at the right time. Does that make sense, everyone? Perfect. So then in the, go back to here, when you look at the object, so the, it, it could also be a novel object, right? You we, we are going to look at the object. It's going to tell us where to basically position our arm so we get a better idea of where it's going to go. And we already start shaping our fingers, just like a prehension task comes to you, you look at it, time to contact, and then you can time your grasping motion. Yes, exa exactly that. So Casey's even talking about an example of, oh, like I look at my coffee, it's, let's see, now I know where it was, and then I can grab it. It'd be much more difficult if I didn't look at all, then I, then I, then I wouldn't have, uh, I'd miss. So doing all of this research, it's not fairly complicated, but at least, do you see how now this is giving us ideas of how we control our body in terms of movement? Yeah, so I have actually, uh, if you look up, look up, I think lecture eight, there's a video of um, the goalies. So they need to see the puck coming off the stick and then need to see it at the end. They don't need to see its flight through the whole, you know, defenseman and the centerman and all that stuff. So with catching a moving object, um, what about vision of the hand? So we've talked about how you need to see the object initially to get an estimation of where it's going to go, and then at the end for time to contact. Do you need to, so you need to see the object, but what about to see your hand? Do you need to have vision of your hand? Yes or no? Because it would be peripheral vision, right? You don't need it. Except if you're uh, inexperienced or just learning, it's going to give you the movement, right? It's going to give us feedback about where our hand is. As you get better, you can better utilize proprioception, and you don't need vision of the hand. And these are what this study showed. They had uh, people uh, that were inexperienced or experienced ball catchers. I'm not sure how they defined that, but that's what it was. And what they did was they looked at um, the number of, so when uh, they were catching balls, they looked at the percentage of ones that they caught and ones that they didn't. And then what they did was they had um, like blinders. And so they had the people then do the same study with the blinders on so they couldn't see their hand. And they looked at when they missed the ball or didn't catch it, what was the reason? And so what they found was within this study that when um, you had the blinders on, the reasons why the inexperienced people would miss the ball was because their hand wasn't in the right position. Whereas in the other cases, even with the experts, errors were typically due to um, grasping error, meaning that it would the ball would come off their fingers. So it was in the right position, but they just timed the catching wrong, which means their time to contact, their towel was off. 
they they lost sight of the ball. And on that note, let's talk about um, striking a moving object. Because striking a moving object, so like baseball, hockey, is like catching a moving object, except it's not just grasping. Now you're doing a whole other motor skill. So this would be more difficult. And for the baseball players, when I ask you know, who knows baseball, what do coaches always tell baseball players when they are um, trying to learn how to bat? Keep your eye on the ball. Can we all agree on that? Does anyone, can anyone confirm that that's what's said? And so that's going to be because of this towel concept. If we have, uh, so with baseball players, if we have different speed pitches, so a fastball versus a uh, um, slider, something slower, change up, um, do the batters, so, so for a, so I swing for a, a bat, or sorry, I swing my bat for a pitch, if the pitch is slower, do I slow down my swing? So does this does the swing speed change based on the speed of the pitch, or is the swing the same every time? The timing is just different for a slower pitch. Purple vision. The timing, yeah. So the the swing is the same regardless of the speed of the pitch. It's the timing, which is right, which is why looking at the ball is so important. Brianne, you're going to practice, and then we're going that you're going to do that for your assignment. So, if timing is so important, with an example of baseball, which is striking moving object, what we notice is that when the, the, the people are doing the motor skill, their head is so stable. So look at this. As an example of a bunch of baseball players hitting a uh, baseball. In this, uh, there was a study and they looked at like amateur baseball players, uh, amateur hitters versus professional hitters and the movement, uh oh, Um, the movement of the head with the professionals was so much less than the movement of the um, amateurs, meaning that the baseball players were so good at hitting because they could have the stability of their head and therefore their eyes were better able at picking out the ball and therefore timing the swings. Oh my gosh, what am I doing? Sorry guys, clearly I'm being a rookie right now. There you go. So look at these different swings. It's like the whole body's moving and the head, look, 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 the head's on even nothing. And so what we see in motor skill, um, and specifically with like stroke patients and people relearning to do different types of motor skills is they can, they can adopt um, inefficient positions and movements of the body initially for the head staying stable because vision is so primary. And so in this example, we can look at the head and it's not moving at all. And that's, a, that's applicable to other motor skills in that we need a stable head so we can utilize our eyes because our eyes are so important in terms of timing. Did everyone see that? Did everyone notice all of the, that in all those examples, the, uh, the head wasn't moving? Cool, right? Okay, so 
let's talk about now locomotion or moving. That's different than striking an object. Um, the difference with this motor skill or locomotion in comparison to the ones that we have been doing or talked about previously um, in this lecture is that locomotion being a continuous skill, but specifically locomotion, um, it utilizes a stepping pattern generator. So I don't know if we, did we talk about this in Intro to Movement Neuroscience? But there is a, 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 a pattern generator or sort of a of inner neurons in the lower spine that sort of helps control the rhythm or the rhythmic activation of muscles with walking. So when you're walking, you aren't concentrating on moving your hips. It kind of like you get it going and then it just kind of happens. And then you, if you want to walk faster, you tend to like you feel your calves are pushing on your toes. So this is different in the other types of motor skills in that there's also this sort of like mechanisms that is assisting with the motion. Yes, exactly, Casey. But with the analysis of walking, you can try to understand um, what you observe and apply it in a rehab setting. And so with, uh, I don't know if you've done this yet, um, Casey, but when looking and analyzing, like when people are walking, there's a rhythm. And then when in stroke patients, it's like the rhythm is lost. So you can try to evaluate what the normal rhythm would be and try to teach that in um, a rehab setting. Also, I, I don't know, have you had any like stroke walking patients? Casey? Well, you can notice that in that, so what, even with walking, vision is going to be utilized at making sure we're walking on the pathway or like the, the sort of lane that we're intended to and picking out objects that we need to interact with or, or um, sort of like a, you know, consider like either like a void or make contact with. Again, head stability is so important. And so initially, those stroke um, patient examples are an example where they can adopt an, an, an inefficient pattern initially because they need to have maintain stability of the head. Oh, perfect. So Michaela and Brianne um, have worked with uh, stroke patients in terms of walking. Have, have you noticed this idea of um, they can adopt inefficient walking patterns to maintain head stability. Okay, yeah. So Samantha actually brought up a good point. So the idea of tunnel vision. So Samantha is saying that, um, so her patients that she's experienced, they lose peripheral vision and they get what's called tunnel vision. And that's because, remember, like, so you have your central vision. Your central vision is gonna be very important in making sure that you're, that you're on path. And then you're gonna look at objects that you may or may not have to avoid or what's coming up or targets for time to contact. Now with stroke patients, they, it's like they have to relearn the skill. So their eyes aren't, they have to focus for longer and, and screen for longer to pick out those objects. Whereas experienced people, they can only, they can take snapshots so they can have a better opportunity to look around. Just like the whole idea is like, as you get better at a sport, time slows down or the game slows down because your eyes don't have to focus so much on what you're doing. It can sort of look around, same concept. Does that make sense everyone? Perfect. So with looking at what vision does with walking in not stroke patients, but in general for everyone, central vision is going to be very important like the other motor skills at maybe not saying like, remember how central vision with prehension was looking at the object and the intended use. With walking, central vision is going to be utilized to make sure we're on the pathway, it's going to look at a target, that's where we're going. And then, oh, that's the target, that's where we're going. And then constantly adjusting, you know, 
the target of where we're walking to. So in a sense, it's for contacting objects and then also avoiding objects. And so if, if let's say we're walking down the path and then there's an object placed in the way, we're going to look, so we're going to looking at the path and we're going to look at the object towards the last minute to make sure we get the time to contact so we can time our avoiding of that object. So central vision is the same thing. It's just applying this in a locomotion or walking sort of scenario. There was this study here by Lee et al. Any high jumpers or track and field people? Long jumpers? This could apply to long jumping too. Anyone? Oh, wait, did I? Oh crap, I screwed up. What would that be? Visual neglect. Oh, I, sorry guys, I missed. Do, 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 do. Moving their hands a lot, but still bumping to parents. Okay, yep. Similar. Oh, sure, sure, short jumper. Ah, uh, well, okay, so for short jumpers, you're not moving. Um, the point of this study was that, so think of like long jumpers or high jumpers. They'll start off at one spot and they have to run to where they're going to jump off and then they go. So as they become experts, are they going to use the exact same, like, look at the way that their legs are moving. Are they going to do the exact same steps as they get better? Because it's the same distance. So the study wanted to look at that. So if, if you were to, like, look at the footsteps of someone um, long jumping or high jumping and then have them do another trial, is the footsteps going to be exactly in the same space? No, right? So no, they're not. Like, it, that's the point. And so this was a, they were looking at stride length as an example with the variability. The stride length was very variable towards the end of the motor skill. And that's because with every trial, there's a zeroing in phase where there would be central vision looking at the target and that would give you your time to contact. And then based on the timing, you would adjust your stride length to be able to hit the target and jump up. Does that make sense? So in this case, central vision was useful in making sure that we got the timing of contacting the target. Ooh, I've done triple jump, uh, hop, skip, jump, yeah. Tell me about it, Casey. Tell us about it. Are you comfortable going on the mic? I don't know. Make it interesting. You are not. Oh, so you're about to jump. It's hard to time. Okay, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> that's all you got. Okay, well, fair enough. Any questions so far with the uh, the lecture? We're about eighty percent done. Cool. So now let's get into the next little bit about talking about action preparation. Oh. An action preparation is a term to describe the processing time that is before the initiation of movement. So I decide I want to pick up my cup. I, I look at it, look at where it's going to go. There's a reaction time before I initiate movement. So from deciding I want to move or action intention, to action intention and visible movement, there's our processing time. That experimentally is called action preparation. So the processing required for motor skills. Do you all remember reaction time? The concept? And how it was utilized initially as a great measurement at understanding motor skill and motor control? Do we all remember a reaction time? Do we all remember reaction time? No one remembers reaction time. JP, do you remember reaction time? Is it frozen? Someone say something.
Okay. You're not frozen. Y'all just not paying attention. And that's fine. Your reaction time is slow. But this concept of reaction time, this is the research. They were looking at action preparation or pro processing time. Ahmed, you just keep your eyes on the road and make sure that you don't get an accident, okay? So what uh, research looked at was this concept of reaction time as processing, the processing required. So you could do motor skills, change different variables, and see how it affected reaction time. Therefore, if it increased reaction time, it caused more processing. So whatever you changed was clearly something that required the brain to do more effort. And by simply doing that and analyzing different tasks, you could start getting an idea of how um, or what's involved in the motor control of our body during different motor skills. So what we're going to be talking about now is really quickly just different variables that were analyzed uh, and sort of evaluated and um, observed that affect our reaction time. And therefore, there are things that affect processing or action preparation. Has anyone ever heard of Hick's Law? So if you consider, um, you know, uh, stimulus response sort of experiments where think of like a um, traffic light. There's three different choices. Each color is going to require a different response. When you increase the number of choices, you're increasing the amount of processing, processing that's required. Hick's law states that as you um, add more choices to a stimulus, so add a number of, if you increase the number of response choices with the stimulus, you logarithmically increase reaction time. You increase premotor processing. Yes, on that. Because what you're doing is your brain has to decide, okay, so traffic light, there's three different options. What happens if you had eight different options? Your brain is anticipating one of eight different things now, and so it has to say, oh, no, it's this one. What if there's 15 different options? Oh, my God, now it's, now it's choosing between 15 different options. Each time, it has to process more and more, right? So let's look at this application in sort of a real-life setting with martial arts. So this was, uh, you always use this video, but this was a gentleman that was training um, uh, police officers. And so he was talking about an application of Hicks Law in that with self-defense. There's one other component here that's huge, and that is Hicks Law, another scientific measure. Hicks Law basically says, I'm going to do layperson stuff because I'm not a scientist, that the, the, theoretically the fastest response time a human being can have is if there's one stimulus and one response choice. That if I add more choices, I slow down response time. And if I add more stimuli, I slow down response time exponentially. Now look at your defensive tactics manual. Look at the average self-defense book. Our system has 4,000 moves. And I'm going, so you have no clue what to do in a fight, right? You know, and, and obviously there are exceptions. There are some genetic freaks out there. I always tell people, don't mistake the trademark for the truth. Unless that person is your bodyguard, the fact that what their accomplish, uh, accomplishments uh, demonstrate doesn't mean that that skill is transferable to every single student. Does that make sense? In our train the trainer classes, the first thing a, a prospective instructor writes down is do not show your students what you can do, show your students what they can do. Cool? Because we all get into that. We, we learn our parlor tricks and we go, hey, and then people want to learn it and it's dangerous. You need to demystify the whole process. Questions? So the Hicks law, it's, it's great to have a scientific measure, but what's your demo? What's the, that's the theoretical, what's the empirical? Well, if I'm over here like this, Tony does, and we'll do this slowly because we don't have any gear on and, and I'm getting old. Um, I'm talking to him, my hands are up. We all agree this is an instinctive natural position. Uh, actually, you can do this fast. We'll, do, uh, we'll go through a series of moves. He comes in with a haymaker. Okay, do you all see? I flinch, I push away danger. I'm standing in front of him, haymaker. This one you'll have to slow down. He comes at me with a he with a headbutt. I flinch, I push away danger. He comes at me with a left hook. I flinch, I push away danger. He comes at me to tackle me. I flinch, I push away danger. 
He comes at me, but he tackles this side. I flinch, I push away danger. The flinch is ambidextrous. If I say, look out over here, your hands will come up. If somebody says, look out over here, my hands will come up. Okay? If, because you're all police officers, I'm standing here talking to the guy with his right hand. With my right hand, I'm going to point to your left hand. But thank you for mortifying me in the class. Um, I meant your correct hands. Oh, the correct hand. <laughs> I hope that was real, Andy. Okay, so here we are with his correct hand, his left hand. He's going to lunge at my gun. Watch this, guys. There's the flinch and push away danger. How much, listen up, how much more significant is, is incorporating the flinch there, pushing away danger, than having a skill set that says your move starts when he has your gun? Talk about vicarious liability. Standing here talking to the guy with his right hand he grabs. But I still flinch. Do you, you see Hicks Law here? It doesn't matter what he does. I'm doing one move. One move. Does that make sense, everyone? So if there's only one response to a stimulus, the reaction time is the quickest. And as a motor control sort of analysis it makes sense because then your brain isn't deciding between multiple things it's just one the more it has to decide between the longer it's going to take to recognize or process that yep if uh so so now we're going to continue on i think there's eight different things so the second thing that they realized that um, would affect reaction time or action preparation is that uh, if someone is given a hint on what was, so let's say we have different choices of an option to, um, like so uh, think of traffic signal, right? Or another situation where we have um, choice reaction time, where we have multiple choices as to what the response will be for a particular stimulus. If you get a hint of which one is going to come up, that decreases the reaction time because then we're, we're being told that information before the stimulus so we can like sort of start processing in advance. Does that make sense? It's called a pre So you, if you give someone a hand. If you were to give someone a hint and then they the stimulus comes up and it is the, the, the hint was correct, the, their reaction time is faster. If you lied to them and then the hint you told them, it was all, uh, different, the reaction time is gonna be even longer because then they're like, oh, they have to reprocess everything. So there's gonna be a reaction time plus a more reaction time to like now figure it out. The third thing that they found out in uh, research, this whole uh, concept of uh, stimulus response compatibility. And so there's multiple different examples, but if the response required most closely resembles the stimulus, specifically in novel situations, the amount of processing required is less. And the easiest example I can come up with is, have any of you tried to cook off of someone else's stove? And then you have to put on uh, like the burner and you've got to, you have to look at the diagram to figure out which burner which knob corresponds with which burner? It's something that we can all sort of relate to, hopefully, right? Ahmed, his girlfriend and mom still cooks for him, but maybe help out today. And then you can uh, be present in this example with the class. If, <laughs> if the controls are arranged in a similar fashion to the burners, it would be a lot easier to process than, okay, JP, Turn on this burner. These are the controls. Which one is it? Uh, probably this one. Probably. Right? There's more processing required. Here's another example of, uh, can, oh, okay, 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 okay. Can someone share their screen? Have you guys ever heard of the uh, Stroop effect? Oh, man, would you do it? So what I want you to do is share your screen. 
The Stroop effect is this whole idea of stimulus response compatibility. And so click on the link, and the Stroop effect is when you get someone to read a bunch of colors. So you have you know, red, blue, green, yellow, but the color matches what is written in the word. The amount of time that it takes for you to say the word is less. Now, the, sec the Stroop effect is when you take a list of words, or sorry, a list of colors, and you'll have like the word blue, but the color of the, of the word is red. You have to say the color of the word. It's incompatible. Then all your reaction time increases. It's more processing required. I, 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 did, it, I did it for the last class, but so, someone try it. Someone share their screen. Oh, yeah, perfect. So then if you've all done it, let's practice it. Someone click on the link and then do it because you, you can see the change in reaction time. Do I have to stop sharing my screen or for you to say it or? Are you doing it on it? Someone do it. But do it out loud. I can try it if you want. Yeah, go. So then, so you guys, can everyone in the class can follow along, um, but click on the link and then it'll give you a list of words and then um, Jacob's going to read it out. Um, and then the first example, the color of the word is the word that like what's written. And then what it does so to get through the word, the word list is going to take like 15 seconds. And then the second time, the color and the word are incongruent. And then to get through the whole list, it's going to like double. So I just got to say whatever color the word is reading. Uh, no, you got to say, you have to say the color of the word. So not what the word says. Okay, bet. I'll try. Yeah. Can I go? Go. Okay, sick. Um, red, green, blue, yellow, pink, orange, blue, green, blue, white, green, yellow, orange, blue, white, brown, red, blue, yellow, green, pink, yellow, green, blue, red. That was when they were the same. Okay, and what was the time? Uh, oh, I didn't go finish. It was, without the last three seconds, it was 12 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting there. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, and then. I'll do the second time. Okay. Gotta read what the word says. No, no, you gotta read you oh. the color. You gotta say the color, not read. Green, yellow, white, pink, orange, blue, red, yellow, green, blue, red, blue, green, red, pink, blue, yellow, pink, green, orange, red, yellow, orange, red, green. That was like, that was 20, 20 seconds. That yeah, time. it's, it's harder, right? It's mm -hmm. more processing required. So this is all of you. This is something that you're all going to do, I think, in the third lab. You can look it up. Um, do you guys ever play like Mario Kart or like watch racing? You were in the beginning of a race, how there's usually a warning signal and then go. Warning signals, signals. Warning signals are used because it allows people to focus uh, attention. So you, you notice them in races. But if there is a, for every trial, if there's a warning and then your stimulus signal happens at the same time, you're gonna start anticipating that the signal is gonna, ha or the stimulus is gonna happen at a specific time. So you can start your processing ahead of time. So it tends to decrease reaction time. This study was interesting in that uh, it looked at movement complexity. So it, it had a stimulus come up and you either had to do a six part move or a three part move. Six part would be more complex. And then the reaction time it took to initiate the more complex move was larger. So you had to, uh, that, so the complexity of movement affected processing. Does that make sense? On that note, movement accuracy. So let's say you uh, close your eyes and then you got to open them and then hit the, the targets right, that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. Depending on the accuracy constraints um, needed, that's going to affect reaction time. So more accurate movement is not only going to change movement speed, but Think of the processing. Oh, to be more accurate, I really got to consider my movements, right? It's more processing.
So reaction time is also affected by movement accuracy. Um, hopefully this one does make sense. Can you think of like a, uh, so the last thing, oh no, second last thing, the repetition of movement. Um, think of, give me an example of a motor skill where you're doing the same uh, move, like the same uh, skill in like in a series, like repetitively, like dart throwing, or um, think of something where you're doing something in quick succession. Mm. Any examples? Mm. Sure, probably gaming something. If if you have to do a motor skill, there's a reaction time, right? Yes, sure, starting to drink something. Like, think of this concept, right? If I have to do a motor skill, there's a reaction time or processing time. If I, as soon as that done, immediately have to do the same thing exactly the same way again, the reaction time decreases because you've already processed it. The brain doesn't have to reprocess it or it doesn't have to reprocess as much. So, so maybe with the balking example, so we have to hit the... the hit something and then it's exact same hit each time you're probably your reaction time to the stimulus is going to be much less because you've already processed it does that make sense everyone this last one's super interesting they this was a sort of in relation to like sports if i am uh what's jp's a uh, Hockey, I think, right? Anyone, basketball, hockey, other sports that would involve oh, soccer. If I want to get around, so I'm, I'm an offensive player, and I need to get around a defender, what's the best way to get around them? I try to, like, fake them out, right? Why does faking work? Exactly. You're doing that because you're trying to get the defender to bite on one of your movements that you're faking, right? That concept, you're trying to break them ankles, yes. You're trying to <laughs> broke ankles. I don't know if you guys remember that. Name. But what that call what that's called experimentally is called the psychological refractory period. And what that means is that, okay, so imagine me and Matthew, okay? So Matthew is the defender. Do you want me to be the defender, Matthew? Okay, so you're standing right there and you're very intimidating as a defender. And so I can't get around you with blinding speed. I have to sort of get you to bite on a move because I need to get around you. So if you're looking at me, you're in front of me, I'm going to go to the left. There's going to be a reaction time for you to respond to that. So let's say that that move will take, I don't know, a second. Let's say this is a second, okay? For me to move and then you to react to that, recognition that I'm going to the left, or my left, is going to be one second. If I go to the right, that reaction time for you to anticipate or to sort of recognize that and go to the right to block me is going to be one second. If I fake to the right and you bite on it, and then I go to the left, your reaction time to go and get me is not going to be one second. It's going to be much larger because you have anticipated that I was going to be going one way, your reaction time caused you, or sorry, your processing caused you to initiate that movement, and you have to follow through with that a little bit before you can recognize I've gone the other way, and then implement the next motor program to go to the opposite direction. So if you look at this here, each time to anticipate to my movement was a second. So I went to the left, it would took you a second to go to the left. I went to the right, it took you a second to go to the right. If I go to the left and then fake, and then fake go to the left, you bite on it, and then I go to the right. If I go to the left, I fake it, then go to the right, you would anticipate that it would be a second plus this little bit of time the actual amount of time that it takes is larger than that. There's a refractory period where you have to sort of follow through with the movement that you initiated, right? Because that gets sent out. 
maybe the brain's already process it's it's processing so now it has to like calm down before it can reprocess a new movement there's this like sort of refractory period does that make sense everyone yeah like uh, so now that you know this whole refractory period Yes, that's something that we can all agree on that we've seen. Like anyone that plays sports, you want to fake someone out to get around them or like in any, like, so many sports, right? But the reason is because there is a, now we, we realize it's because of a delay in sort of a prep, or action preparation that the brain can only process so much. And that to, if you've decided to process one move and then you had a change in mid move, it, the, it, the brain has to like take a step back and then reprocess before it can reprogram a new move. Any questions? We've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to go over a little bit, but I enjoyed the back and forth. Everyone okay? So we'll finish off with talking about characteristics of the performance that will influence um, reaction time. So now we've been talking about environmental variables that would affect our reaction time or action preparation. Now let's think of different um, personal, remember how we talked about uh, in the beginning of the course that what will influence our motor skill performance? We have the environment, the skill, and the performer. Let's talk about how different performer variables or characteristics would affect our reaction time. We've talked about being stressed, right? So stress tends to um, affect our reaction time. If we have um, increased alertness, so if we're more aware, and that was the whole concept of like a warning signal, that tends to reduce um, reaction time. The more attention we have on something, we can better time our movements, we can better be um, aware of everything, and so that tends to um, help with processing if we have more attention into our um, motor skill. That's why the concept of like a warning signal was used in races. That effect of um, decreasing reaction time with a warning signal only lasts for about one to four seconds. Right? So warning, they, they, they zone in with their attention and then after about four seconds it's too long and then they, they lose that attention benefit. But this whole idea of alertness of the performer and how it relates to reaction time is why we have like sort of like um, Oh, truckers are in the news. I don't know if you guys have, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but like, so with like truckers, they can only drive for a certain amount of time. Any truckers in the class? Or people, like family members that are truckers? What about air traffic controllers? There's also an amount of time that they're allowed to work for because they have to maintain a certain amount of alertness. And over time, the longer you hold your alertness, you start to lose attention. And once you lose attention, then your reaction time suffers. We're going to talk about this next day. Um, sorry, does anyone, any questions about that? No, okay. The second thing, um, we're going to talk about this next day, and we've discussed it, I think, in the third lecture, no, second lecture, when we were talking about like choking in sports. Depending on where the performer is focusing their attention will affect their processing or their reaction time. So when um, someone's performing a motor skill, it's best to focus on the object or the stimulus or the signal we find that if the person develops an internal focus, they're overthinking the movements of their body, it tends to affect their ability to perform efficiently. They sort of um, are, are not allowing for the body to do the sort of uh, coordination that it's been practicing. By overthinking it, they're sort of breaking the cycle that they've created. Does that make sense, everyone? Did I screw this up? No. Is everyone okay? We're almost done. 
two more slides. So up to this point, we've talked about reaction time as a measurement of action preparation. Um, let me ask you all a question for whoever's we're still here. What do you think, when we've talked about it, but what do you think is happening in that preparation time? What, like, what is what is going on in processing? Through common sense or through intuitive, um, intuitively thinking about it, or from sort of the different studies that we've talked about today, what sort of things can are we processing? Yeah, well, so we're processing, yeah, the environment, everything, everything, right? Yes, like there's no really wrong answer. We have to process everything in relation to the motor program, like Matthew is saying. So with, with what Samantha is saying, we got to look at the environment, pick out what's the most important features to be added or as a parameter to the motor program we've already practiced, right? We would pick that up in the environment, specifically probably through our vision, like Ahmed is saying. Your brain has to process so much, right? It's got to use central vision to pick out the um, target and then look at the direction, distance, trajectory, um, maybe how much like uh, end position about how you're going to manipulate and what you need to consider with your hand. It's got to look at, okay, well, how much are you going to grip by? It's processing a lot, right? Oh, absolutely all of that information. So now it makes sense that there's a reaction time in, right? Like, not, can we all can we all understand now that there's going to be an amount of time that it takes for your brain, even how how great and and powerful and and how the cerebellum has rehearsed all motor programs. There's a lot of processing that has to re be required, right? What else? So this was one study. So we've talked about. Um, in, remember we talked about in the third lecture about uh, the premotor cortex and how when you initiate movement, you first have to control the postural muscles so you wouldn't fall over. That is also something that's added into the preparation phase. We have to adjust our posture. And this, there was one interesting study where they had, uh, they looked at, um, <laughs> they, they looked at, uh, uh, the the firing patterns of your muscles based on um, you had to they had a step and they had to step on the step so the participant stimulus comes on and they have to step it's just step on a step okay <laughs> super weird but they either had to one light would come on that, that means they step on the they step on the um, step with their foot or on the stair with their foot, and then they bring it back down. Whereas if another light came on, they would have to step on the step with the intent of, of now climbing a stair. So one is, a, one is just placing the foot. The other one is placing and then stepping with the intention of stepping up. Based on the two different uh, colors or stimuli, they saw that there was a change in the order of the activation of muscles. Like the postural muscles altered based on which stimulus came up, whether or not they were going to just place their foot or place and step up. Both would require different amounts of stability, right? So in that, in that preparation phase, in that action preparation, that processing was all occurring. It's crazy. We talked about this in the, the feeling of the zero. Oh. Any questions, anyone? We talked about um, piano players, I think, in the second lecture, and discussing how um, with the supplementary motor cortex, we are evaluating um, the sort of uh, motor skill that are coming up in like a, so a series of motor skills, where the supplementary motor, motor cortex is considering what we're going to be doing in the future to adjust the movement in real time. So with piano players, they're playing piano and there's a specific way that they have to hold the keys. If a high note is coming up, they can adopt an altered position so they make sure that they hit that high note. So clearly, the brain is processing what's going to be going on in real uh, ahead of time and adjusting the real time movement 
that's going to be happening in action preparation. And then the last thing is uh, something that I found really, really interesting. Um, for all of you that uh, has anyone played basketball or anyone watch basketball, when someone is going to go up for a free uh, for a free throw, what do typically we see all the different NBA? They all have their own like sort of like unique way that they practice, right? They do something, or even golfers, right? When they go to step up to do golf, they have their own sort of like practice rhythm that they do. What about dancers? Any other examples? Everyone has their sort of like pre-performance ritual. Hitter, yeah. Oh, hitters in baseball are huge about that, right? Why do they do that? What, what is it? What are they doing? They're practicing the rhythm or their timing. So if you look at the movement, they're practicing the movement and the coordination before performance of the actual motor skill. So in that action preparation phase or in the sort of processing, they're trying to rehearse the rhythm of their movement. But yeah, oh yeah, we got boxers. Runners, runners, right? Like they, whew, right? Like you see runners where they like, they'll go sprint and they'll like they'll practice. Uh, I don't know, like we can think of that, like everything, everyone does it. Volleyball, they, well, no, okay, so volleyball, right? They'll prep before they serve, they do one of these, right? The tennis people will, uh, will practice pulling up the ball before they serve it. Now think about this whole idea of it's called, so what that's called is called pre-performance rituals, where the performer is rehearsing the timing of their motor skill. Now that we're considering it, think about it like all over this weekend and then, oh, it's reading week next week. You're going to be like, oh, wow, look, that's, it's so apparent now that you're, and now it's in, in mind. Any questions, anyone? How was that? Not too difficult today? Very difficult. Awesome. Cool. I know it's a lot of information, um, but I wanted to present it in a way that you can all understand and realize that um, it is it is a lot, but not in itself very difficult. It all sort of makes sense. And it's applicable to everything that you're going to do in terms of like stuff moving forward with kinesiology in tons of different fields. So um, Olu was asking about the midterm. I think so was Michaela. Um, remember, we have another lecture before the midterm. And next week is reading week. So there's no lecture. Then we have lecture six, then the midterm. So there's time. Um, I encourage you to um, go through the lectures, rewatch some of the videos of the synchronous lectures um, to give you sort of an idea of the backbone of what's most important. And then you can go through and have that backbone and then it won't seem so daunting when you're going through the, um, like the lecture slides. Yes, so just to confirm with what Alyssa is saying, the uh, midterms on the 11th during class time, it will be with Respondus browser lockdown and that whole thing. And um, I guess your homework is to have a really good reading week. Everyone okay? Had a really a good time uh, teaching today. And um, I'm going to miss you. Yep, it's going to happen. Okay, bye everyone.